Thank you. So many years ago, some of you remember I started teaching anthropology here. I'm still teaching. Thanks to Barbara Morgan and Naomi, we have this wonderful class that is about coastal foods. About four years ago, we got a grant from, it was a USDA grant that's part of a statewide consortium called Drumbeats. And we started with beach foods. And as our class went, we learned that you had to eat, eat a lot of seaweed and gumbos. Ah, that might be a tough diet and hard enough to get calories and, and everything. So we decided, well, maybe a deer would wander down to the beach. So maybe we should talk about coastal foods. So we really have expanded it over the last few years. And in our class, we do a lot of fun projects. And one of them is this recipe book, cookbook that we're working on. And we're going to add to it this year. Uh, so we have a class in the, in the fall. We do two one-credit classes, and then in the spring we do one longer class, and we rent the uh, Alaska Fish House thanks to Chuck Slagle, and we cook one night with our different menus. But during our classes, we also do some cooking, um, depending on it. And we have with us one of our presenters, Earl Hawkins, who helped with our gumbo cooking last year and is going to do it again this year. So we, we've been learning a lot about the foods, how you find them, and I never realized there was quite as much as there is to know. I mean, there's things I knew that were edible, but when do you pick it, how do you pick it, and how do we do it so it's sustainable and you're not wiping it out so that it's not there next year, and then what do you do with it? So tonight we have Barbara Morgan and Naomi Michelson to talk a little bit about the ecosystems, resources and how to use them. So I'll limp on back as <laughs> oh, hot up here, Barbara. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Barbara Morgan and I'm gonna to try to talk loud enough everybody can hear me in the back. So is this kind of okay? You can more or less hear me? Um, it's my pleasure to be here this evening and to be presenting to you. I'm gonna kind of try to turn this a little bit. In an empty chair right here, if somebody wants to have, come and sit, there's a chair right at the front here. So um, I had um, actually had the pleasure of teaching various different science classes for a number of different years. And I started with high school level in Thorn Bay and then teaching at the university level here, the Natural History of Alaska class. And a lot of times when we're out on field trips, students pick something up and they ask me, can I eat this? <laughs> and um, sometimes I'm I'm amazed at what they think they could possibly eat. <laughs> a barnacle? Are you serious? But but um, this has been a learning experience for me because in investigating sometimes to find out if they could possibly eat it, um, barnacles actually are edible. They're related to crabs and um, the really big ones you can get enough meat out of to make them worthwhile. And gooseneck barnacles have a stalk that is edible. So I learn just as much by teaching these classes as I believe I pass on to other people, and I know more to pass on the next time. So when Priscilla um, approached me to see if I wanted to help teach these different food kind of related classes, um, I was super happy to be able to do so and kind of felt like my experience telling students, yes, you can eat that, or no, you can't eat that, or maybe you can, um, kind of it had prepared me to be able to, to, to talk about what you can eat. So um, tonight is actually just going to be kind of a little bit of a snippet of, of some of the most popular things that you can eat in this area. Um, we started kind of dividing up the course material uh, based on where you can find it. And so we kind of have four different kind of mini ecosystems or ecotones, you might want to call them, here in the area, uh, the ocean, the beach, the forest, and the muskeg. And each of them has quite different things living in it that you can eat. So um, without further ado, I can talk a lot. And Naomi has food. In fact, this, these tables are off limits for now. Um, when I'm done talking, I'm going to introduce Naomi, and she's going to then present about what she has here for us to, to munch on. So please wait. That's going to be the end of the presentation. So let's... We're going to start with the forest resources, which is, of course, terrestrial land, um, but not actually a wetland. So anything that's not like a muskeg, basically, is terrestrial. I'm kind of calling forest area. 
And this forest that we're in right here is a temperate rainforest. You might have noticed we get a really lot of rain here. Um, <laughs> it uh, uh, makes for really good plant growth, which then um, provides home and forage and whatnot for a lot of animals, too. We have more biomass or living stuff on the land here than anywhere else on the world, in the, on the planet, really. Our biomass here is, is even bigger than that in a uh, tropical rainforest. So what do we have here? Um, we have crab apples. It's one of the things people don't really know we have a lot of. Uh, there's a few that live around Ward Lake. Mm, and, um, that's one of the places I've seen most of the ones I've seen. They have a small apple on them. Um, harvesting them is a little bit hard because the, the branches have little thorns on them. You want to harvest them after they become a dark purple and you can then kind of boil them down, strain them, and uh, cook them up and make a really nice jelly out of them. Jelly or jam. Um, kind of on the beach forest fringe, you can find chocolate lilies. They look really pretty. They're dark brown. They do not smell like chocolate. They smell like poop. <laughs> um, there's not all that many of them, but when you pull them up around the rhizome, the base, it's kind of a bunch of rice kind of looking stuff. I do not recommend going out and harvesting a lot of this because they're kind of a little bit rare. But in a kind of a survival situation, if you're out and you need something to eat, this is a, a, one of the few sources of carbohydrates we have in the area. It's a, the rice kind of at the base of the the poopy smelling flower. Isn't that appetizing? <laughs> um, we have Devil's Club. A lot of people are familiar with Devil's Club. I don't believe any part of it is edible, but it is a really important um, medicinal. Yes. I know that bears eat the berries, but I've not heard of any of people being able to eat them. Bears are, Naomi's going to correct me. Uh, the oh, the buds. the buds. That's right. First thing in the spring, when the buds, the leaves are just coming out, before the, the spines are hardened, you can, like when they're like an inch, maybe an inch and a half long, you can, you can pick those and uh, do a quick blanch and then saute them in like butter and garlic or, you know, um, treat them all like spinach, and that's really good. So they are, the, the new buds in the spring are edible. Primarily, though, people use the inner bark as a medicinal. And you can make a salve, you can make a tea. Um, it's good for a lot of different kinds of things. So Devil's Club is a, you, you don't want to grab it, though. It's not a friendly plant, but it is a really important medicinal plant in this area. Um, we have highbush cranberries, which are actually not a cranberry, but they taste cranberry-ish. Um, when they're ripe, they're actually kind of a bit hard to pick because they're kind of a skin full of juice with one big seed in it. So if you Hold them too hard, they smash. But they are worth it. Um, you can juice them and drink the juice, which is a little intensely flavored, or you can turn them into jelly, which is really good. Um, they're high in vitamin C and other phytonutrients. Salmon berries, we all know and love salmon berries. Best way to eat them is straight off the bush. So, yeah. Thimbleberries, another um, one. Some people think that these are too seedy. I don't. I, I think that they make the best jam in the world. So um, they're they like a lot of sun, but then enough water to keep them from drying out. So so thimbleberries is really good. Um, blueberries, and we have kind of we have a, a few different varieties of blueberries. They're all in the vaccinium genus, and some of them are these like dusty blues. That's what I call them. Others are really black, and some people call those black huckleberries. There's, and then, then we have huckleberries, the red huckleberries, too. And those are all related. They're all in the same genus. And they are all really tasty and all are um, really high in different phytonutrients that are healthy for you. So um, those are pretty commonly harvested. Also in the forage, we have a few different kinds of, a bunch of different mushrooms here. Our really high uh, rainfall in this area um, keeps things moist and things like moss and ferns and mushrooms like that here. So we have a few, quite a few different edible varieties of mushrooms in this area. I'm going to do a slight warning caveat. We have a couple poisonous varieties too. So unless you really know what you're doing, I would not recommend going out and harvesting mushrooms by yourself. 
find somebody like Leif, Se Leif Sieverts, and I think is the expert here in Ketchikan. Um, go on one of his mushroom walks. Go out with somebody who knows what they're doing and have them actually point out what is edible and what's not. Chanterelles are really good. Um, the way you can tell a chanterelle is that it has false gills, which means that the gills look kind of melted together and they run down the stem. There's a look-alike that looks almost like a chanterelle that's not edible, can be slightly toxic even, that has true gills, and those true gills do not run together and they don't run down the stem. So these are really good if you know what you're getting, but you want to be careful, okay? Um, we have a coral mushroom, or, or bear's head mushroom they're called. These grow on rotten wood, and they're really quite lovely to eat. They look kind of funky. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but they're, they're a really lovely uh, mushroom that you can eat. They dry very well. And they have angel wing mushrooms, too. These are one of the most recognizable ones. They grow in rotten wood, and they, uh, they're pure white. They have true gills. They're really lovely sautéed in butter. Everything is really good sautéed in butter. <laughs> <laughs> Even barnacles. <laughs> And then the chicken in the woods, um, or some people call it a, a yellow sulfur mushroom because the edge is such a, a brilliant sulfur yellow kind of color. Um, this is a, a, a type of shelf fungus, and when they're kind of new and, and kind of little, the whole shelf is edible and is really tasty. As they grow, and they can get really big. I've seen shelves that are, like, big. Um, most of it gets kind of really woody and hard, but the edge is still edible. You can eat that and har harvest that and eat it. So um, those are some of the most commonly eaten mushrooms in the, in the forest here. We have hedgehog mushrooms with various different kinds of other mushrooms that are edible as well. But I can't be exhaustive tonight because there's too many good things to eat around here. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Um, muskeg resources. Uh, so, what is a muskeg? What I found actually learned here fairly recently is not everybody in the world calls muskegs muskegs, which that's what they're called though. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's what is a muskeg? You know, sphagnum moss or peat bogs. So we have a lot of them around here. Um, they develop on areas with no drainage or very poor drainage. And so it, the, it pools water, and the, the sphagnum moss starts growing there. This is the peat moss right here, the sphagnum moss. And the great thing about the sphagnum moss is that it naturally produces acids. And that inhibits microbial growth, and it keeps all the organics that are in the muskeg from decaying very well at all. And so then in this very poorly drained area, you get a, over, you know, eons, a buildup of that peat and organic material until you get peat bogs, and some of them around here are 40 to 60 feet deep with the peat all built up. Um, the, the acid makes the peat bog effectively a dry environment because that the acidic water can't be used by the plants that, that live in it. So all of the plants that you see in the muskeg are going to have thick, woody stems because they are protecting themselves from the acidic water made by the, the sphagnum moss. Um, that being said, because they are, because it's a basically a dry environment and they're living off of the rainwater before it mixes with that acidic water, that's the only water they can use. Um, the plants are very slow growing. They're often stunted. Um, if you damage them, it takes decades for the, the muskeg to, to repair itself. So um, they're, they're a very fragile environment. I would not recommend going and tearing around in one on a four-wheeler or trying to drive a piece of equipment into one. Um, there's one that I know about in on uh, close to Edna Bay that a piece of heavy equipment did ride out into it and come back out, and 
then I've been able to kind of keep track of that over the years a little bit. And even after close to 30 years, the edges, you can very clearly see that track mark still. The edges are barely starting to kind of grow over the sides. And so that's 30 years later. Muskigs are a fragile, delicate environment that are important, and we don't want to be ru ruining them. So um, peat moss has a great use, has a few great uses. The first one is, is that you can mix it into your garden soil, compost up a little bit, adds really good organic material to your garden. The second one is that if you dry it, that acid, it's very absorbent. Um, and then it has the acid in it that makes it slightly antimicrobial. And you can use it as a wound dressing, um, diaper, and also um, women use it for their have in the past used it for their menstrual cycle because it's a, a, um, so absorbent. So it has uh, beneficial uses for us. Um, also in the muskeg, there's, muskegs are really fascinating. You look out over them from a distance and it looks like they're just kind of empty, but um, they're not empty. The plants are little, but there's a, a pretty big diversity in the muskegs and there's quite a few resources that are really valuable. Um, the juniper berries grow in the muskegs, and they have an interesting cycle for their berries. They set on new berries in year one, and those are the ones that are kind of real pale, dusty blue. And then it takes a full year for those to ripen. And so then you'll come back, and then on the same plant, you'll find the really dark purple berries, and those are the ones that have taken the year to ripen, and those are the ones that are ready to harvest. So harvest the dark purple ones, not the pale blue ones. And um, you can usually crush them up and use them like juniper berries like you would any any juniper berries. Um, they're used as a meat seasoning. Um, you can eat the berries and it's a good uh, decongestive. Um, it's a stimulant. Some people say they've got caffeine in them, but they don't have caffeine. It's a different chemical, but it is a stimulant. So you don't want to take too many of them or too late at night because then you want a little bit of a fall. But they are a good um, bronchial dilator. So that's, a, that's handy. And they grow like this tall. Some kind of, kind of sprawling. They're, they're little plants. Uh, Labrador tea. And this is Labrador tea in bloom. Um, the way, there's a couple other plants that grow in the muskeg that look a lot like Labrador tea. The, the underside of their leaves is just white. Labrador tea, the underside of the leaf is fuzzy and goes from being like a pale yellow kind of fuzzy to a really deep dark orange kind of a fuzzy color. So the lookalikes are smooth and white. You don't want those. Labrador tea has fuzzy that turns yellow and then dark orange. So that's how you can tell the difference between those two. And Labrador tea, or Hudson Bay tea people call it, is a well-known medicinal in this area as well. You make tea out of that. Um, I should say, too, Labrador Tea and the Devil's Club are both strong enough medicinals that you don't want to just willy-nilly just take as much as you want to. Um, it, they can make you sick. So if you want to be involved in doing some kind of medicinal um, plant, whatever, find somebody who knows what they're doing, who really knows what they're doing, in order to help you learn what you need to know. Okay? So I'm just kind of giving you some information to just kind of pique your interest, but not enough for you to go off and do this really by yourself medicinal stuff, okay? Um, so we have bob blueberries, too. People are really familiar with the fact that we have the big, you know, bushy blueberries all over the place. But if you go out into the muskegs, there's little blueberry plants. They're little. But look at how beautiful those blueberries are. They're really tasty. So um, you do, however, have to either bend over and pick them or wear a rain gear and go ahead and sit down in the muskeg and get comfortable. And sink it. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, I put salal in with the muskeg kind of section, but really they're kind of between the muskeg and the forest. They're kind of and along the edges of forest. Um, Salal is a lovely berry. Um, people call them smiling berries or laughing berries as well. And they have a really kind of a rich, robust flavor. Uh, some people I know like them better than blueberries. Even, so, um, And the foliage is kind of a thick, heavy leaf that is an evergreen. It's green all year round, so it makes a nice uh, addition to bouquets in the middle of wintertime if you want some greenery in your house. Um, 
So loud berries you can bake into a pie, um, make jam, jelly out of them, syrup, a um, bunch of different good ways. If you try to pick it, often the skin will come off and the rest of the berry won't be there. So the best way is really just cut off the whole little spray of ripe berries and then put them in your bag, bucket, whatever, and then put them in the freezer. And when you put them in the freezer, the, um, the freezer will break the berry off of the little stem thing here. And so then you just go through and pick out all of the, the rubbish and keep just the berries. So that's the easiest way to do that. Um, also in the landscape, we have two different kinds of cranberries. We have lobish cranberries and bog cranberries. Um, lobish cranberries are also called lingonberries. And this is the bog cranberry, and it is kind of lays down. And the leaves are almost narrow enough to be needle-like. And the berry itself grows on a long thread-like kind of a extension off the top of the stem. And there's one or possibly two berries on the end of each thread. Okay? Um, now I've done it because, oh, previous. Excellent. Um, the lowest cranberries and lingonberries grow, like, about this tall. And you have up to like, one or two, between, like, one and six or sometimes seven or eight berries on the very top of the stem. Um, some people like to keep them separate because they're, they're different. I call them all, you know, they're, they're cranberries that grow in the muskeg. And so I put them all in the same bucket and enjoy them all together, which is lovely. So lingonberries or lobish cranberries, these are, I mean, that tall. The bog cranberry is also this tall, but they kind of lay down. So um, they're another one that you need to wear. Wear your extra tufts, put in your rain gear, go ahead and get down on the, yeah, get, com get comfortable um, to pick them. So both of those make a really nice like cranberry sauce or cranberry jam. Um, you can dry them and use them that way. So they're, they're some of our, our great resources in the muskegs. So there's the bog cranberry. Um, I just blew right through that. You guys have no idea how much I'm leaving now. Um, <laughs> yeah. You should sing so much more. Um, our beach resources. This is actually where we started. Uh, Priscilla was mentioning we started teaching these foods classes about the beach foods. Um, a lot of people aren't used to thinking about a lot of the different things that we have on the beach around here. Um, the beach is actually a very productive area. It has the benefit of having terrestrial land and nutrients from the terrestrial land, and then also the marine environment and nutrients from the marine environment. So that makes it a really productive area there, um, and ecologically really interesting, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm going to leave it there. So. One of the things people do know about around here is the beach asparagus, um, or sea asparagus, or people call it, or beach, beach uh, sea beans, people call it sometimes, too. And uh, that's, that's really lovely. They have the high, the, the, the stems, they really are just stems. They're kind of a little bit, they're round, kind of fleshy stems. They're segmented a little bit. Um, you want to harvest them kind of uh, spring, early summer, before they get a thick, woody stem up the middle. <laughs> um, they're good. You can eat them. You can blanch it and eat it raw. Uh, can it, pickle it. You can put it into soups or stews. They're a little salty. Not hard to imagine them being salty since they have a salt water man. And they have kind of an interesting crunch because they have a high silica content. Um, another name for them, in fact, is glasswort, which makes sense with the fact that they have so much silica in them. Um, so silica is a vital nutrient for us. If you're needing silica, Eating beach asparagus will get that for you. So, um, goose tongue is another green that you can get off of the beach and eat. It has a flat leaf. You can see here, kind of. Um, it's kind of a flat, fleshy, long, pointed um, leaf, and you and the leaf is what you harvest and eat. And you can. Blanch it and then basically treat it like spinach. You can eat it raw and salad. You can saute it in butter. It's um, You want to be careful. Those are kind of a look-alike that we don't. You don't really. You don't want to eat because it's uh, 
um, arrowgrass can, if it grows under dry conditions, have uh, a compound in it that is poisonous, can be deadly. Luckily for me, because I was confused as a kid and was taught wrong, um, I ate quite a bit of arrowgrass, but we have a lot of rain, so it did not grow under dry conditions. <laughs> so, anyway, it'd be good to know what you were looking at, though, and eating before you start eating the beach greens. Um, sea lettuce is common around here in the spring when you look out on the beach and there's this just bright green all over the beach and it's this big flat kind of leafy kind of stuff. Um, that sea lettuce, you can dry it and then crunch it up into soups, uh, on salads. You can roast it in the, um, in the oven with a little bit of olive oil or whatever. It's quite tasty. Um, this is the, uh, what people call black seaweed. It's actually a red seaweed, um, called Porphyra abate. Long, kind of ribbon-like, stretchy. Uh, you harvest it; it's kind of this reddish color. As you dry it, it turns that really dark color that looks like black. So, it is high. One of the highest in um, kelps or seaweeds in proteins that we have around here. So, um, that's a. And good luck trying to get somebody to tell you where they where you go to go and mm -hmm. get some, mm -hmm. because it's highly prized, and people are really loath to tell you where they're going to be getting their stash from, okay? <laughs> so, um, but luckily we have potweed, um, which grows everywhere. It turns nice, bright, kind of golden yellow in the spring, new growth, and the, 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 the tips, um, you can see here, this is new growth, and the tips are really flat. That's, you want to coat that to, to, to harvest the tips, before they start to inflate. So harvest the flat tips. They do inflate um, as they become sexually mature because that's where the gametes are forming and you, uh, they all, and has all kind of slimy, you can smash them on your siblings and that's a lot of fun, but you don't want yeah. to eat them. <laughs> okay, so when the, the tips are nice and flat though, you can harvest those. Um, Blanch them, they turn bright green then, and you can put them in stir fry, into soups, um, put it into salad at that point. You can dry it and crumble it up, but it's a little bit ro robust kind of tasting, and it's not to everybody's liking. Um, my dad likes it, but okay. <laughs> I'm, it's, it's a little strong for me. Um, really good, they're doing some studies right now to find out um, I think it's for diabetes prevention or control. Um, and this grows all over the beaches around here. So it's healthy and it's available. We have sea urchins in this area. And um, we've got two different kinds here, actually, Strongulocentris purpurea and Strongulocentris, um, oh, no, not purpurea. So I'm both strong heel centers, though, sea urchins. And the way you eat them is to break the bottom out and shake the guts out of it. And then there's five lines of um, gonads up the side of the inside of the shell. They're test, yeah. actually. And you can scrape those out and eat them. Um, yeah. Um, that was my response when my dad wanted me to eat some as a kid. And I actually did try it because you know it's my dad. I was like, okay. I didn't like it. I thought it was crazy. He was eating it and thought it was great. Um, since then, I've learned this is uni. So if you go to a restaurant and you buy, it's a delicacy. It's a delicacy. Oh wow! And people pay gobs of money for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, my dad was right after all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Limpets grow all over the beach here, and they are safe to eat at all times of the year. Um, they're related to snails. You can see the foot there. So kind of think of a kind of Alaskan escargot. Um, you can harvest them and just put, you know, wash them a little bit, put you know, shell and all into a skillet with a little bit of butter and cook them very briefly just until they fall out of the shell and eat them. Um, garlic is good in that mix too. You can um, invert them on a cookie sheet, put them underneath a broiler, quick cook. Um, they their lifestyle is to crawl along rocks and use their radula, which is kind of a rasp-like tongue, to scrape that slimy algae off of the rocks and eat it, which is handy for us because that slimy algae does not have PSP toxins in it, 
So they never have PSP, ever. So if you want to have some kind of fresh seafood, whatever, escargot, you can get these, and it's always safe. Um, same with gumboots. They're always safe. They have an arugula. They do the same thing, scraping the algae off of the rocks and eating it. Um, this is a delicacy here. Um, they're really tasty. You go out and get those. And you, if you cook them right, which I didn't know how to cook them right until I was starting to teach this class. And, butter. And Mer butter. <laughs> how did you guess? <laughs> Merle came and showed us how to do them. And uh, they're really they're, they're um, readily available and never toxic. So that's And they taste good. Uh, we have abalone in the area. These are actually listed as endangered, though. Um, and I am putting them up there. I considered not putting them up there because I didn't want people to be going out and harvesting them. Um, they need to have a chance to rebound. There's some indication they might be rebounding. But um, they are super tasty. So I think it's worth letting them rebound so we have them again so that we can be harvesting them. Um, they're a marine snail as well. So... Sea cucumbers. You can. These are kind of in the transition between the beach and the ocean. Actually, they're kind of more oceany maybe, but you can get them from the beach in a really low tide. And you can eat. There's, so if you cut them open, the inside of the skin has five white muscles down the, the the whole length of it, and you can peel out just those five muscles, which is what people out here mostly do. Um, other people, other cultures will eat the whole muscles and skin thickness together, sliced very thinly. Um, the muscles, I just the five muscle strips, those are lovely. I think those are great. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple different kinds of clams around here, which are really lovely, as well as cockles. Um, little neck clams and butter clams both. And they are filter feeders, as well as are the cockles. Really great to eat. Can be very toxic. They uh, filter feed, so they... they have the, the opportunity to be eating some of those toxic phytoplankton, um, Alexandria being one of the, the worst ones, um, that causes PSP. So if you eat clams any time of the year without having them tested first, you're taking your life at risk. So there you go. They're there, they're really tasty, but they're risky. Any clams that you buy from a store or any shellfish, like oysters, whatever you, you buy from a shellfish grower, have been tested and those are safe. And mussels, also really tasty. Um, they can form extensive beds. They're all over the place. Um, they also are filter feeders and are prone to PSP. And when they get toxic, they get really toxic fast. So that's even more dangerous. So just be careful. Um, last section is ocean resources. So that, of course, it's the marine waters around here, and we have a plethora of different resources here. Um, Lincoln, which is lovely. Be careful of those teeth. Yes. So handsome. <laughs> Halibut, um, which are, of course, you know, usually uh, dark on top, white on the bottom. My sister and her husband, um, long line, that's one of the things they do. And one of them, they caught actually this white kind of pattern on it, on the top, too. Never seen that before, so that's kind of interesting. They didn't sell it because she wanted to see what it was like inside, too. And they ate it, and she said it was totally fine. So, But anyway, halibut are good. I'm pretty sure everybody knows how to cook halibut. You have your best recipe. Uh, we have a bunch of different kinds of rockfish around here. Just short little mention here. I wanted to say that um, all of them are really good eating. So these are some of my favorite fish. And if you're out <coughs> trying to catch a fish and you catch a rockfish, and you just throw it back, um, it's dead. It's dead. It will never live. These can live up to 120, 200 years, depending on the species. And so if you catch a fish and just toss it back and the eagles eat it, um, you are killing a fish that's older than you're ever going to live. Um, it is worth it to go ahead and recompress it. It's a, there's a number of different kind of recompression holes. If you recompress the fish and make it go back down to where it usually lives, its uh, eyes will go back into its head. That's Stomach. ophthalmic barotrauma. Thank you, Rachel. Ophthalmic barotrauma, and its stomach will go back into its body. 
and they have 90 percent 90 survival rate at that point. So please don't just go, oh, it's a bomber and it's a junk fish and throw it away. Either eat it because it's really good, or recompress it. Um, salmon. Yeah. Um, you need to have about five minutes to get it back down to where it was, and you can do that with like a milk crate that can a weighted milk crate to push it down, or a barbless hook that you've inverted and caught through its. So a barbless hook, a weight, um, your leader, make it go through the mouth of the rockfish, make it go down. When it gets down to where it wants to live, it'll actually just swim off the barbless hook. The easiest way. Um, so anyway, not to get too caught up in that, but yes. Well, I was just going to uh, mention the video. People want to look online. They can if you want to hear Rachel and them sing about it and talk about it, um, Google rockfish recompression, and they tell you all about it. And it's a good, it's a nice video. It's fun kind of rap sort of. Hey, listen up. That's my proposition. <laughs> heading out of the sun to do some something session. <laughs> I've heard it a few times. Um, all other different kinds of salmon. I think we're pretty familiar with those. Those are all really lovely to eat. So we need to protect our salmon resources. <laughs> so we continue to have them. Um, herring. We need to protect our herring resources as well. Um, they are good pickled and smoked and fried. Uh -huh. And. In butter? Yeah. <laughs> herring eggs as well. Uh, another resource. And um, traditionally uh, allowed to spawn on hemlock boughs or on kelp. And then you, you collect it and eat it. So, um, really nutritious way to, to eat the herring, herring eggs. So, yeah. <coughs> Um, Hooligan also an ocean resource, um, very high in oil. You could either like smoke the whole fish and, and then like eat it or fry it and eat it. Um, traditionally, people press them down into big boxes basically to extract the oil. And hooligan oil is a dipping oil, it's called grease. Um, really healthy. <coughs> um, octopus. Oh. They are really tasty. Um, you want to cook them either for a very short period of time, I mean a really short period of time, or for a very long period of time. If you land somewhere in the big middle there, it's just super tough, and you can chew it for forever. It's never, that, it, it doesn't. Um, but yeah, octopus are good to eat. We have a bunch of different kinds of crab here. Of course, king crab, dungeness crab, tanner crab, um, shrimp, a bunch of different kinds of shrimp as well. And we have scallops around here, both the purple hinge rock scallops and the weather rain scallops. And I put these up here because, of course, they're good to eat. Um, the, the big adductor muscle is the part that you want to, to eat around. Um, since, so there's some question about whether or not scallops are prone to having PSP. Because you're not eating any of the viscera or the the um, <laughs> gills or anything of the scallop, you're only eating that muscle. And the thought is that they probably don't have PSP, but they're still working on testing that to know for sure. So still be careful. Okay? And I want to just end on kind of a note about harvesting ethics. We have a lot of resources around here. Um, some of them are very abundant. Some are sort of abundant. Some are not very abundant at all. Some of them are being used by a lot of people. Some are being used by only a few people. So when you go out harvesting, I would, I would just like to recommend that you take only what you really need. Um, share with friends, family, et cetera. Um, leave some of the easier harvest areas for people who might be less able-bodied. If you kind of are a more able-bodied person, go ahead and hike in and muskate for a little while before you pick your berries. Leave some of the areas among the, area, the, the roadway for people who have a harder time walking. Um, harvest gently. Uh, use a knife. Um, go ahead and stand there at the berry bush and pick the berries. Don't break off big chunks of bush and damage the, the bush. Uh, beach asparagus, don't just rip it out by the roots. 
cut it above the roots so you leave the root system there so it can grow again next year. Um, all of these are in, just, just can be sensible, not just, just be aware of the fact that it's in your best interest as a forager, as a harvester, to be treating the plant or resource, whatever it is, uh, with respect and gently so that you are leaving enough to be coming back again for next year so that you can harvest more. Um, also then, not only be respectful of the harvest, but be respectful of how you process it so that there's no waste or little waste. Use as much as you possibly can. Um, it drives me crazy seeing people hunt deer and just peel out the back straps and leave the rest oh, of it. Yeah. Oh. It's like, no. <clears throat> so, um, and then also then be careful of who you tell about foraging. Because if you, oh yeah, these are great, but the plug, you just go over here and but this, that person might not be respectful and you kind of pass information on to somebody who's going to maybe, you know, wreck things. So, um, so kind of help perpetuate that, that ethical harvesting idea. So, um, I think I, I might be out of time. I might have been passed out of time, huh? I told you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm sure you have questions. I'm going to be here. I'm going to turn it over to Naomi right now, though. She has all of this really lovely food for everybody to sample. This is Naomi Michelson right here, and she has done most of the gathering and harvesting and preparing of these different things for, for us to try today. So thank you, Naomi, and she's going to introduce you to what we have here so that you can be a little knowledgeable as you try some of it. So, Naomi. All right, thank you, Barb. So I'm a seasonal person, and uh, meaning like I go around like, during the seasons, and I, I can't wait till some of the first greens come out. And the, one of our first foods that come in the spring is the herring eggs. Barb mentioned that. And then after that, we have some of our <laughs> greens that come out, like the sea chickweed, or we call that uh, the sandwort. Um, after that, then we have some of the beach lovage and uh, goose tongue and arrowgrass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Barb and I both uh, ate arrowgrass. We didn't really know. That, um, and we got lucky yeah, yeah. that it wasn't put um, on here. And yeah. uh, uh, beach asparagus and uh, fiddleheads, kind of like May. Uh, lots of different things. But um, So what we have mostly is uh, what I've canned, and then the things that are fresh are what's seasonal. So what, what's fresh right now are the bog blueberries, the lingonberries, the uh, salal berries, or you, know, you still have a, maybe a week, depending on where you go. And um, and I have a section over here where there's some dried plants. And feel free to open and smell some of the different, like the spruce tip. Um, those were dried, and it's a really uh, nice, makes a nice tea. We've uh, experimented, and Barb made some uh, amazing shortbread. Um, not for tonight, I'm sorry. Not for tonight, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've, we've been experimenting in our uh, class that Priscilla was talking about, um, using some of the foods using traditional foods and some of the uh, maybe foods that weren't traditional and combining those to, uh, to just uh, eat good food. And um, it's also um, uh, good for you. What we know about a lot of our foods is that they're the best things that we can eat. And um, as far as nutrition-wise, they're just off the charts. Um, the bog uh, cranberry, for example, and the lingonberry are, um, I think, the top. Um, I I'm really excited to have a little bit of cloudberry tonight, which um, here in Ketchikan area, it's kind of hard to find. Uh, it's a, it's, it's, um, if you're up in the Bethel area or up in the interior on the tundra, they call that their salmonberry, and we, we call it the cloudberry. Um, and so they have it, uh, I think it's much more abundant there, but I have a mix of, a I was in uh, Bethel, and so I had I got some um, cloudberries, but I also actually picked some this year here, so it was a good year for the cloudberries. Um, my husband um, went out and got some of the chanterelles that are just to look at, um, unless um, our wants to saute them up. No, <laughs> but, uh, but you can see what they look like, and then over here we have some of the dried chanterelles and um, hedgehogs. You, so you have over there some uh, some labor soup, and the labor is the black seaweed soup right. over there. And um, what, what, what other things do you have there? 
The labor soup had brown bread that you made. Well, I'm just going to go through it all. And okay. then um, my part's a hands-on, right? Everybody gets to try something, and hopefully there's something that you like. And uh, my philosophy is, uh, you know, it's trying to be healthier, but if we can all implement at least one new wild food in our in our diet, you know, maybe we, might, we might not like all of them, but... Um, and then um, before I explain what all these things are, I also wanted to say that for me, I get to bring my... Um, grandkids out and so um, especially if you want more berries <laughs> yeah. so, and, and if you're looking for the low ones with uh, cranberries they're really good at finding those I have to you know you really are getting you're bending way down and you know your back hurts and so but they can find them pretty quick um, so starting with this uh, section right here we have fireweed jelly and I think it's beautiful um, it's this bright uh, pink color and Barb made that jelly um, Spruce tip jelly, and um, so the spruce tip is that green part that I new saw. growth in the spring. The new growth yeah. in the spring. That's the, one of the other um, fun things that come out in the spring. Uh, salawberry jelly, and if you haven't had, how many people haven't had salawberries? Oh, good. Uh, if you haven't, it's one of my favorite <laughs> berries, and it's uh, often overlooked and or in the way, or uh, you know, it takes over. It's a very strong plant, but uh, they use it all over in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, traditionally we used to dry them into cakes, um, and we might have stored them in oil or some type of thing. But the slawberry it has a really uh, deep blueberry. I kind of—it's hard to explain, so you have to try it. And um, of course, these all have um, the slawberry jelly has a little bit less sugar than the other two. Um, then I have some uh, tomatilla bulk kelp salsa, and. So it's just tomatillos mixed in with some of the bull kelp. And um, over here, it could be a little spicy. I don't think it's that spicy, though. Um, uh -huh. It's the bull kelp salsa, which is mild. And um, I'm going to open this up, too. It's some pickled beech asparagus. And I have some bread and butter kelp pickles. And um, this is um, salal berry hot pepper jelly. And so um, you could try it with a little cream cheese. And then there's some fresh salaberries you can try. They're um, uh, kind of a leather. Some, some people might say they're kind of leathery or, you know, the skin is a little bit tough and seedy. Um, so I make jelly out of it. But I also love to eat them. It's just that it's easier to make a jelly. Um, and then um, the, the, I'm going to pick that part because it says sauteed and garlic. But this is just gentle to look at. But um, if you haven't seen them or looked at them and you want to learn how to identify the chanterelle, it's here in this basket. And um, there's also, if you're not doing sugar, I have some different, you know, the fresh berries are really good. Uh, this is a mix of cranberries and lingonberries, and they're fresh, so, you know, put a little bit in your plate, fry them. Really tart. Um, they'll be a little bit better uh, in a, about a week, too. I think the longer um, after the first frost. But um, I, like, I, I got some now. This is a salmon dip with um, a sweet bull kelp relish. I had this is my first time using bull kelp in summer, and um, so I did all from, you know, just different things with them. And I really like the sweet relish. And um, sea cucumber fritters, are we? Hopefully warming some of those up. Sea cucumber, um, saw that. Uh, I don't know how many have tried sea cucumber before. Mm -hmm. Good. I, I love it. It tastes like a, between a clam and a, I don't know, what? <laughs> Abalone? Um, um, crab apples. Now, these aren't the ones that are wild here, but um, I have to say thank you to my husband. He takes a few from our yard, so um, he gets, those are also really tart. And um, and also um, there's some fresh um, brown bread. It's a Minnesota recipe, and uh, I like to honor my um, heritage and the food that we eat in this area. But I'm married to a Scandinavian, and so I honor his. So um, I have this brown bread recipe from Minnesota, and also the Cloudberry uh, recipe is uh, called, it's a cloudberry cream, and I don't even know, I'm pretty sure I'm not pronouncing it right, but Multa Creme is the um, name of uh, Norwegian 
with desserts and um, the seaweed and clam soup. So that's in, in the back here, and we could, and it has the black, or sometimes people call it nori, and that the black seaweed is the seaweed that we use on sushi. So um, that's the one that we like the most. Uh, and then there's also, uh, it looks a little slimy, but it's alaria, and it's just, it just has a little bit of uh, soy sauce and some sesame oil on it. You could try it. Um, we were really fortunate to have Dolly Garza in April, and her motto was dry it and try it. And so you might not like it, but um, you know, these are some of the best things that we can eat. We call all of the seaweeds a sea vegetable. So, um, and I would like to. Thank, before we get started, uh, I'd like to thank Lila and Kalani. Can you come up here? So they, Lila and Kalani are my granddaughters. I have nine. I have another little baby up here, but they helped gather the cranberries and the lingonberries. 